What's up, everyone? Welcome to another Tuesday q and I'm here hanging out with Jazz School Chris. What's up? Yeah. So we're going to answer some questions today. We're going to talk about gear. We're going to talk about playing and life and all things uh, that, you know, we talk about typically on this channel. Quick yeah. announcement, though, before we get into it. Uh, we are running a sale till the end of this week on the Nashville Number System course. You can get 40% off of the Nashville Number System course uh, if you use the code, I believe it's NNS40 at checkout. Link's in the description. It's also going to be posted here in the chat. So uh, yeah, if you guys want to get your hands on that, you can follow that. And that's going to go to the end of the week. So if you're watching this later on replay, uh, go pick yourself up a new course. Actually, Chris and I, yesterday, uh, we decided it's time to start a new video course um, should be coming out. The goal is by Black Friday. Yeah, but that's that's, that's a tight goal. It's a tight goal, you which yeah. which, <laughs> which really for me means it's it's got to be done by the end of October because I'm going to Germany for most of November. So, all right, yeah. let's see. First Everyone, question. let me know where you're tuning in from here in the chat. Um, I can actually see the chat today, so this will be nice. Uh, if you want to leave a question here. For the Tuesday Q&A, you can at me in the chat, at Rhett Scholl. You can leave a Super Chat donation, which we greatly appreciate. Helps keep the channel afloat. Um, so, yeah. Chris, I think you already have one picked out, right? We do. We have a very great first question from Sean. He says, Rhett, I just wanted to know how long that do you think it will be for me to reach Josh Scott level of slide tone? Have a good show. Well. <sighs> how long will it take? The bar is pretty low, honestly. So... Give it a week, maybe. Week? Week, yeah. For, starting from like square one. Like you've never touched a slide before, I think a week. What if he's never touched a guitar before? Week and a half. That's fair. That's, That's fair. fair. Yeah. All right, next question. Uh, there's a question talking about if you have, you know, your pedal board set up with your power supply. If you run out of, you know, if you run out of inputs, do you just daisy chain the rest of them? What do you do? Do you buy another power supply? This is a good question. So, uh, and I checked right before we went live and... Uh, we got Uncle Mason in the chat from Vertex, the rig doctor himself, uh, and he's a really good person to, to ask this question. But yeah, pedal power supplies, uh, they are somewhat of an elusive thing, but it's actually, it's, it's pretty simple. Ideally, you'd want to have an isolated power supply for each pedal on your board. That helps to prevent noise, um, electrical noise, ground hum, all kinds of issues. Specifically with digital pedals, uh, some or even like my analog delay um, on the, the studio board that Mason built for me, those can be really susceptible to noise as well. So it's important to have a good, clean power supply for your board. Um, when you run out of ports on your power supply, there's a few workarounds that you can do. Um, so for instance, let's say you have three drives on your, your board. Let's say you have two overdrives and you have a boost on your board. Well, if they're analog overdrives, they're pretty simple circuits. Uh, there's nine volt overdrives. Oftentimes you can have a uh, split cable so that one or, or two, sorry, uh, pedals can actually share a power output. Um, most of your typical like nine volt power outputs on like a, a Chalks power supply or a Voodoo Labs power supply or a Strymon power supply are going to be at least 100 milliamps output uh, and 9 volts. The Strymon power supplies, I think, are up to 500 milliamps. And um, depending on what overdrive or boost you're using, the pedal might actually only be pulling, like, I don't know, 20 milliamps, 30 milliamps. They really aren't that power hungry. So, yeah, you can combine some pedals to one jack. Um, and then if that still doesn't work and you're still out of ports, then you may need to upgrade to a bigger power supply or get a power supply that allows you to um, to daisy chain another one to it. So for instance, like the Strymon Zuma, you can get a smaller, I think it's the Ohi, little uh, smaller offshoot that just plugs into the Zuma and you can add a few more ports. I know Chalks, I think does the same thing. So uh, yeah, power supplies, man. You could do a whole episode on pedal power supplies, I think. Yeah. Okay, so um, speaking of pedals, are there any good pedal ideas you've come up with or like, what's your dream pedal if you could make one? Who asked that? Red Car Records. Nice. Um, well, I'm actually working on a new pedal right now, 
with Zach from Mythos Pedals. Zach's a good friend of mine and the co-host of the uh, Dipped in Tone podcast. If you guys don't listen to Dipped in Tone, I'd highly recommend it. Um, and he and I sort of kicked around this idea. It started off as a joke of, of starting a brand called Shoyles, as for Shoal and Zach Broyles. We are like, oh, what a terrible name for a pedal company that would be. And then we decided to actually start that. So we're working on a fuzz right now that's going to be essentially my dream fuzz, I think. Um, I'm not going to give too much away right off the bat, but suffice to say... Uh, it's going to cover a lot of ground and it'll have an octave circuit. Um, it'll basically be like the, the one fuzz to rule them all for me at least. So there's that. Other than that, I, I don't, I don't really think up pedal ideas very much. It's not, not my bag per se. So, uh, hmm. yeah. Okay. Totally off the wall question. Favorite Beatles album. Revolver. Revolver. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like that one. I like Revolver. Revolver's cool, and admittedly, I'm more, I'm not as up to speed on the Beatles as like a lot of my friends that are diehard Beatles fans. Mm. Um, I, I love the Beatles. I definitely enjoy listening to them, but I think I'm more of a Stones fan than a Beatles fan, mm. which might be a controversial thing to say, but you know, I'd say Rubber Soul or Abbey Road. I yeah, mean, both are great. Abbey Road, but both are great. Yeah, I like Rubber Soul too. Um, Sgt. Pepper's is great, yeah. but in the echelon of Beatles albums, I think, I think it's Revolver, Abbey Road, and then Rubber Soul for me. Those are top three. Mm. Yeah, I feel like I feel like this is probably a really controversial opinion, but to me, like Sgt. Pepper is. It's got a lot of cool songs on it, but as a whole album, it's not my favorite. Yeah. But there's a lot of cool, like, individual songs to me. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Okay. Um, Moving on from that hot topic. Hot take. <laughs> Which do you think is better, upgrading pickups or getting a better guitar? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. All right. So I have a philosophy when it comes to selling gear that... I've tried to, to live by, uh, and this will play into the question here, but my philosophy is if you're going to sell a piece of gear, it should always be to move a step ahead, right? So like, let's say this was a, um, like a Ventera Strat here, and I was going to sell this guitar. My philosophy is that if you're going to sell a piece of gear like this guitar, you know, you don't sell it to buy another guitar of equal or certainly lesser value. You always want to move up. You want to take a step forward. So in that situation, if you're looking at upgrading the pickups on your guitar, my, my guess is that the person who asked this is slightly unsatisfied or dissatisfied with their guitar's sound, right? And they want to change something. They want to upgrade it. Pickups are a great thing to do. You can slap a different set of pickups in a guitar and completely change its character and its voice and oftentimes make it sound better. It's probably the best uh, thing you can do for a guitar um, to make it sound better. But if you're looking at upgrading a set of pickups versus getting a better guitar, I think it's the better move is to get the higher quality, better guitar. Because more than likely, that guitar is going to come with a better set of pickups in it regardless. Plus, you're going to get a better made, more well-made instrument, something that might be a little more inspiring to play, something that's going to maybe excite you a little more to play. Um, yeah, that's how I ended up with my first Novo, with my Saris J back there. So uh, sold two guitars, a bunch of pedals, blew out a credit card, blew out all my savings, and uh, that's the best purchase I've ever made. Don't try this at home, kids. Don't try this at home. Don't fo don't follow my financial advice. That's for that's for damn sure. Man, people are people are roasting you for the stones comment. Oh, really? They're saying you had me at revolver, but you lost me at the stones. Oh, pff, spare me. <laughs> Come on, Jesus. Okay, so uh, we got a donation from Tristan Pankratz. Thanks, Tristan. He says, "Hey, Rhett, I love your content. I was wondering, what's your favorite Black Keys riff to play?" Oh man. Thanks for the donation, though. <sighs> um. Man, okay, let me see here. It's it's one of their more simple ones. I'm gonna kick on a fuzz here. See if I can remember how to play it. Uh, 
I got mine. So I guess it would start on. That's it. Man, there used to be a video of them playing that at Abbey Road, actually, on YouTube. And I can't find it. I That video, if someone can find it, please post it up in the chat. Because I've been looking for it. And I feel like it got taken down at some point. Um, but it was back. That must have been off of... Uh, was that attack and release that that song was off of? But anyway, it was it was just Dan and Pat at Abbey Road Studios, and it's mm. one of the best Black Keys performances ever. Um, that's when Dan was playing his big Marshall and Fender rig, I believe. And God, the the fuzz sound he has on that performance is sick. The Black mm. Keys were in Athens last night, and I didn't. Oh, I really? didn't go. Yeah, I wish I would have gone, but. Um, yeah, yeah, I saw them live one time. They're really good live. Mm-hmm. They're really good Dude, live. They're so good live. We did a, you know, we went on tour with them in 2019, so I got to see basically two and a half weeks of Black Keys shows, mm. um, and I watched pretty much every night, and it was so entertaining. The best night though was in D.C. We played uh, this venue. It's the big rock club in D.C. There, um, the Anthem. So. Mm-hmm. The whole tour was like arenas, 10, 15,000 seat arenas. But that club was like a 6,000 cap big rock club. And that was the best place to see them because the, the everyone, it was like a general admission open floor. So everyone was packed together. This was pre pandemic 2019. Yeah. And dude, Before time. the sound and the light show being on the slightly smaller stage and the more condensed room. Oh my God. It was rad. It was so good. Yeah. I saw him in Asheville. It was kind of a big venue. Like, you know, like a stadium type of thing. And I mean, they, they killed it though. Yeah. I mean, there's when there's just two dudes on the stage and it's that huge of a sound, it's something else, you know? Yeah. It's so good. The first time I saw them was in uh, music midtown in Atlanta in 2011. So it was right after, right when brothers came out uh, and they like really started to take off. I went with my, uh, my best friend, Andrew and I went and we were standing out there and that's the moment for me that was like right around the time I was, you know, getting into music. I was at AIM. I was doing all that stuff. And, uh, or no, I think I'd graduated AIM at that point. But anyways, I was sitting in the crowd watching them and, and just like, that's what I want to do. That exact, that's exactly what I want to do right there. Yeah. It's, yeah. Nice. Right. So we got uh, a question from John Prescott. He donated. Thank you. Um, what's a good software for recording, composing, and mixing instruments? I'm on Windows. I've tried Ableton, and I'm wondering if there's something better. Honestly, Ableton's probably your best bet. If you're if you're looking for a DAW to to produce in, um, I think Ableton is probably the most full featured, well rounded. It has it has the most capability. I think a lot of the stock Ableton plugins are really good and. I say that being a non Ableton user. And since you're on a windows, my second suggestion would be logic, but I think Ableton Mm -hmm. outperforms logic. And since you're on a windows machine, logic's not an option. So I would stick with Ableton. I mean, I use Luna here. It started off as a sponsored thing. Um, Universal audio sponsored the backstage live streams last year. And part of the deal I made with them is that we would use Luna for the live streams. And then, I have since continued to use Luna because I actually think it sounds really good and I like the way it works. Um, the, the sort of concept behind Luna is I think they're trying to basically put a traditional studio and console workflow into a DAW and the way it sounds and the way it works, um, which is cool for me. But I don't do a lot of um, like using instruments in the box uh, for tracking. I'm, I'm usually tracking other instruments into the DAW. So for me, something like Luna works a little better or Pro Tools works a little better. But if you're looking to like produce in the box mostly and work in the DAW, I would stick with Ableton. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a Windows user myself. 
Um, and I have Ableton and I like it. Uh, I have some trouble sometimes with the, like the, what do you call it? The software, like the software that your interface detects. I can't think of it right now, but I used to use reason and I liked reason a lot and I never had any issues with that. But like you were saying, it's not as full featured as Ableton. Like reason is really cool and it does some things that other DAWs don't do, but there are some like big limitations with it. Really the answer is just like buy a Mac, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's not the answer. That's not the answer. Like um, That's what they want you to that's think. That's what they want you to think. That's what they made me think. I have I have bought into the uh the Apple I've I've got got by the Apple um Empire. But here's <laughs> what's more important than like a specific DAW, because a lot of people here in the chat are talking about Reaper. I've hear I've heard good things about Reaper. I've never used it. Um mm. I think what's more important than like this DAW versus this DAW is picking your DAW of choice and sticking with it and really learning it inside and out. Like mm. learn the hotkeys, learn the workflow, learn all the tricks, um, learn how to make it sound right, learn how to gain stage properly. Like that to me is way more important than just, you know, oh, well, uh, the, the organ sounds in Logic are not as good as the organ sounds in Ableton or whatever. Yeah, uh, I say pick what you're comfortable with, pick, pick what you like. If you're just starting out, pick what you can afford. Um, or and, do the free trial thing. Yeah, or do the free trial thing. Or student discount if you're a student. Now, I will say, I will say there's something to be said about a, uh, a DAW that includes really good stock plugins. This is what Logic does really well and Ableton does really well. The stock Logic plugins are fantastic. Like they're compressors, they're EQs. Um, are amazing and you can do everything you need to do with the stock plugins and logic which is great when you're starting off on a budget you don't need to go and spend thousands of dollars in all these plugins uh that all the the pros use online you know just just you know a compressor is a compressor is a compressor to a certain extent so learn the fundamentals of compression learn the fundamentals of eq learn the fundamentals of gain staging um and stereo imaging and your your stereo field and all that kind of stuff. And then those skill sets will help you out in any DAW in any recording situation. Yeah. Ray mine says the best DAW is the one you're most used to. Yep. hundred percent. Shout out. Also shout out to Matt Welsh. He uses the sound recorder on windows 95. So (laughs) sick. that's awesome, dude. What a hipster. (laughs) All right. We got a question from Chris Carvalho. He says, I've never seen you playing a Rickenbacker. Why? What you got against Ricks? I don't. I would love a Rickenbacker. I don't have one. Um, and yeah, I, I'm a huge Tom Petty fan, so I want I want a Rickenbacker just be, just for Tom Petty and Mike Campbell. But um, do you know? I think I've actually never played a Rickenbacker. I don't think I have either. Never, honest. never even like picked one up and played one. Um, from what I understand, the the new ones, the current the ones that are being made, are really good. So kind of expensive but it's a rick so i you know I, I would kind of expect it um let's see here oh somebody was following up on this last question here andy says regarding plugins i think that 1600 hundred dollar plugin bundle is still only 50 dollars on sale at sweetwater through the month go check that out people so wow. when it comes to buying plugins um for for the last six years or seven years i only buy plugins one day of the year and it's black friday Everyone puts their plugins on sale on Black Friday, and a lot of times they are insane deals, especially Waves. <laughs> Waves well, Waves plugins are always on sale. I don't think anyone should ever pay full price for a Waves plugin. Um, but save up your money. And you got a couple, you got some weeks now. So what I would say is like if you're getting into this or you got your eye on a plugin or something, start setting some money aside now, and then on Black Friday, just go nuts because uh like I've gotten Isotope, um, like Ozone 8, I bought at a pretty significant discount. That's amazing. I use Ozone all the time in my video production. Um, the RX stuff from Isotope is amazing. I bought that on sale. So, yeah, wait till like Black Friday or Cyber Monday, and that's when you do all your, uh, your plug in shopping. Next. Yeah, I've seen this question a couple times. Um, Guitarful Dexter says, What are your tips on speed? Playing fast. I'm the wrong wrong person to ask about that. Uh, call <laughs> call anyone. Doug Rappaport, 
um, Tosin Abasi, <laughs> anyone other than me. I mean, I mean, yeah, I'm really not a fast player at all. I don't have super fast chops. I think. I mean, I've seen you play some fast stuff. Yeah, but but I can stumble into a sort of fast lick every now and then. But that's different than being able to play. Like Phil X can play fast, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, um, and when I've watched those guys talk about it or or play it. I think it's all about the relationship between the left hand and the right hand together, working together in time. And that's something that I've just never had. You know, if I'm going to play a a lick, most of my sort of stock licks are a combination of alternate picking and legato. Um, So I'm, I'm utilizing a lot of like slides and bends to cover the fact that I, I don't do a lot of like fast alternate picking. What do you say? Like 80% of those notes are picked something like that. <laughs> yes. Somebody in somebody rewind the stream and <laughs> count it. I don't know. <laughs> All right. David, David Munoz says, Hey man, I got the JHF three series overdrive based on your last video. I think he means the pedal video. And he's wondering about how to put together a new board. He wants to know if it should go before or after another low gain drive. Uh, experiment and see what you like. So typically with with drives on pedal boards, my approach is it's a three pedal setup. Overdrive one, overdrive two, and then a boost. I think with those three pedals, you can cover a ton of ground. So typically I like a low gain, super transparent style of overdrive. Uh, For me, that's like the Greer Lightspeed. That's my number one, Um, the Morning Glory. The Morning Glory is interesting because it can kind of spread, span the difference, or sorry, span the gap between low gain to pretty saturated medium gain territory for an overdrive. Um, and then the second pedal for me would be something like the Timmy, so a more medium gain, soft clipping overdrive. And then the third pedal is a boost, either a completely clean boost like the Vertex Boost or something that is adding a little harmonic saturation like a jfet boost for example so with those three pedals you can start to experiment and put them in different slots you could go um, boost light gain medium gain which is going to give you a few different options you could go light gain and then boost that light gain to get more gain out of the pedal because you're hitting the front end of the pedal harder you could go Uh, Same thing with a medium gain. You could take that medium gain pedal, hit it with the boost on the front end, get more gain out of that. But typically what I like to do is um, light gain in slot one, medium gain in slot two, boost in slot three. The boost is acting as like a solo boost. So I'm using it to like step forward or hit the front end of the amp a little harder for more saturation. Um, So yeah, but uh, that's totally subjective. So experiment with it on your board and see what you like better. Cause they're going to have three different effects depending on how, or how many combinations would that be? Three pedals and three slots. Was that like, somebody do the math it's on like, that. It's like 49.34. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, so something job. like that. Yeah. Great. Perfect. Uh, so rolling house, he's a rolling Haas. I don't know how to say this. Sorry. He says, Hey, I'm an inner circle member and thankful. Have you ever used garage band to do any simple demos? It's all I have. Yes. Um, 10 years ago, I got my first interface and it was a Focusrite Sapphire Pro 40. Um, it was on sale at Guitar Center and it was 15 cents back in those days. Yeah, back in those days, man. You could go buy a set of tubes for three ninety nine, and a set of Ernie Ball Slinkies for <laughs> Six ninety nine, and go buy you a Fender Stratocaster for a nickel. You could go get you a Fender Stratocaster for thirty five dollars back in those days. Um, yeah, so I, at that time, all I had was GarageBand, uh, and I didn't know anything about recording. All I knew was the interface got your guitar sound into your computer, uh, and that that was basically it. But the thing about GarageBand is it's essentially Logic Lite. Um, I believe it runs on the same engine, right, as Logic? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's. I think it's the same, the same people who make it. I mean, it yeah. looks 
very similar. Yeah. So it makes it, it's a natural progression to go from GarageBand to Logic. But the thing is, man, like you can cover a lot of ground in GarageBand. Again, it goes back to knowing those fundamentals. It doesn't matter what you're using. It, if you understand compression and EQ and gain staging and all that stuff, yeah, you can get stuff to sound good in Audacity. Yeah. No, I've I've worked with some like students of mine, and they only have GarageBand, and they're they're wanting to like create demos or or like recreate songs they like, and it it's totally viable. You can do pretty much anything in there, especially now they have so many good presets and instruments and stuff. You know about Steve Lacey? No. He's uh he's this guitar player and singer who I guess was a little more popular in like 2016, 2017. He released several albums made entirely on his phone with GarageBand and they were they have like millions and millions of hits. Like there you go. totally just like you know that thing that plugs into your jack and yeah. like you can plug guitar into it and he sang completely just into the iPhone mic like nothing else and that some of those songs have hundreds of millions of hits on spotify it's further proof that gear doesn't matter it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what you use and they sound good too see they do there you go all right okay. uh the depth and whisper says use garage man all the time for demos it's totally satisfying i'm telling you man like if you mm-hmm. if you know just some of the basics you can totally get some good results yeah check out check out dark red by steve lacy that's a great song word yeah cool okay joe joe malky says are you digging the fractal setup and the classic question where do you think it distinguishes itself against the line six and kemper okay cool so um i am digging the fractal setup and actually what i was thinking about for next week's live stream is we may just sit here and build a preset so this is a preset that i was building uh earlier today from scratch this is a an ftr 37 preset you can kind of see it up here um and I've got it. This is like just the amp going into. So it's essentially the the Axe, the Axe Effects version of this amp right here, FTR thirty seven. Um, and this is kind of how I've got it set up right now. Dial in a little more gain there. See how how gainy it can get. So I think that sounds really great. Um, let me know in the chat or in the comments if that's something you guys would be interested in talking about next week. We could like sit and build an Axe FX patch from scratch. Patch from scratch. Maybe that's scratch the patch. Scratch the patch, patch the scratch. I think that's a good uh, series title. So, yeah. where does it distinguish itself in the lineup of the modelers? Um, I think it sits at the top. So, I think it's the best sounding of in terms of Kemper, Helix, Quad Cortex, uh, and then you know Head Rush and and the other things out there. It's the best sounding. It's the most full featured. Um, in fact, I bought this weekend, uh, on the recommendation of a friend of mine, a 12 hour video course that a guy named Cooper Carter put out. Um, and yeah, I bought it and I've been working my way through it because this thing is insanely deep. There's so much detail. There's so much, uh, so many possibilities, different things you can do that I think for most players, it's too much. I think the Axe Effects is like the pro modeler. If you are gigging all the time, you're touring, you're doing all kinds of session work, I think that is the most full featured, it's the best sounding modeler out there. I do think it's overkill for 95% of guitar players out there. Um, And so I would put the Helix next in line under the Axe Effects. The Helix sounds almost as good especially when you're using impulse responses instead of the stock cabs the effects in the helix are amazing um i use the hx effects on my pedal boards all the time and uh, it's way more user friendly than the axe effects is the user interface is far superior you can actually use the front face of the unit or the floor unit itself whereas the axe effects i mean you basically have to have the software editor in order to, to dial it in effectively um 
Kemper, I think, still holds its own. You know, the Kemper does the thing. Sounds like the Kemper. It's really cool. I've been around for 10 years. Um, and the Quad Cortex is good, and I think it will be good in the future, but I still think they've got a ways to go, especially on like their built-in effects uh, and things like that. I think Line 6 still beats them on all that. So, mm -hmm. there you go. Okay. So, um... Where is this question? Here it is. Zako Lache, or maybe that's how you say that. He says, dig everything you do, man. The question is, who's your favorite non-guitar playing musician? Uh, thanks, man. I would say Steve Jordan. Um, mm -hmm. When you look at the career that that guy has had, he's played with everybody. Uh, he's out with the Stones right now, actually, um, taking over for... Charlie Watts, rest in peace. Um, I mean, he was on SNL in the 70s. He was, uh, like, he's literally done everything and played with everybody. Um, he's one of, if not my favorite, drummers of all time. He's one of the most musical drummers out there. He's he's one of those drummers that when you... He really understands music and, and musicality and the song and songwriting. And, you know... That's not true of all musicians. There's a lot of, you know, amazing players out there that I don't think that's necessarily true for. So mm -hmm. I'd say Steve Jordan. Yeah. Uh, hey, Rhett, how do you deal with balancing the output levels of different pickups slash guitars? I find it very tedious to switch from my Strat to the Les Paul, and then all my tone is out of balance. Yeah, I used to have this problem. Um, actually, with the two guitars that I sold to buy my Saris J, my Novo, I had, it was a Fender... 52 hot rod telly the one with the seymour duncan mini humbucker in the neck and then i had a cut les paul custom from 2001 that came with a set of 490 and 498 pickups the ceramic magnet humbuckers from gibson which i think are the worst sounding humbuckers of all time i <laughs> i hate those pickups the 490 and 498 so there was such a huge output difference between those two guitars that the way I eventually got around it was swapping pickups in both guitars. Um, the Fender had an issue where the neck was way hotter than the bridge. Even when we brought the neck pickup down, it was still way hotter. So I replaced the bridge with a Lawler Special T, which is a little hotter. And so that matched that output uh, between the two pickups. And then on the Gibson, I ended up swapping those 490s, uh, the ceramic magnets, with a set of Porter Anthem PAFs. This is the first PAFs I ever bought. And uh, those were a lot lower output. So that brought the two guitars pretty close to each other. Before that, though, um, on gigs, I had a boost pedal. It's actually the reason I bought the Klon KTR. I bought a KTR when they first came out. And I would only use it at first when I was playing the Tele to try and get the Telecaster's volume to match the Gibson. So I would literally switch guitars on a gig, hit the KTR, which was just a clean boost, and that would kind of match it. But eventually I had to swap pickups. So hmm. so Ryan, Ryan has a great idea here. He says, how about you make a patch from scratch on the Axe FX and then make the actual rig with the same amp and pedals that are modeled by the Axe FX. Record it and see if we can tell the difference. Ooh, that's a, that's a video right there. That's a video. Yeah, that's not a live stream. That's a video. So we could do that with the FTR. I've got my FTR cab here. Um, let's see. Yeah, we could we could totally do that. What cab am I running right now? Because in here I'm running the FTR cab. I think you're running the the top one. What? I think you're running. What are you talking about? I don't know. What are uh, you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> the top one? Jesus. The top one. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm running the, uh, uh, yeah, there's two different divided by, so we could totally do that. We could dial in, because in the Axe Effects, they have the IR of my divided by 212. Um, yeah, we could totally do that. Patch from scratch. There we go. Yeah. Uh, quick announcement, if you guys are just joining us. 40% off the Nashville number system course through the end of the week. If you're watching this live or watching this on replay, follow the link in the description box down below or here in the live chat. Use code NNS40 at checkout to get 40% off the course. And uh, appreciate the support. Yeah. 
Guitar Avatar 24, he says, what should an intermediate guitar player learn after the pentatonic scales? Oh, okay. So uh, we were actually just talking about this yesterday. Um, this is going to be a topic that we cover in the next video course that we're going to start very soon. So pentatonics, when you say learning your pentatonic scale, I think there's more to it than just learning. Right? It's learning the pentatonic shapes up the neck. And then I think it's also about knowing where your triad chord shapes are within those pentatonic scales. So if you're there, if you've gotten to that point, I'd say you really know your pentatonic scales. And that goes for major and minor pentatonic, by the way, um, and relative major and relative minor, understanding that. After that, I would tell you to just start learning songs. Start transcribing solos. Start learning vocal melodies. Uh, this is what we were talking about yesterday, actually. There's, a, there's so much to be gained as guitar players from learning vocal melodies to songs. Um, and if you're improvising and you're trying to play a solo and you don't know what to play, a great place to start is play the vocal melody. Play that and then embellish it. Use, start that as your, uh, your sort of jumping off point, your foundation, and then you know, embellish and improvise from there. Um, also, learning vocal melodies, especially in a lot of like pop, R&B, a lot of the, the music that guitar players will learn, at least the guitar players that watch this channel will learn, um, a lot of the vocal melodies are pentatonic based, even if they're not purely um, pentatonic in their composition. And so it can teach you ways of being very melodic in the pentatonic scale and playing stuff that people want to hear and playing stuff that is uh, memorable, play like a vocalist. So that means learn not just solos. Solos are fun to play. We all love playing solos, but learn vocal melodies. So yeah. Yeah, and you can even record yourself singing a solo yeah. and try to play that, like learn the solo that you just sang. Yeah. Because I mean, that's what you want to hear. So play it. Yep. You know, hundred percent. Okay, we got a we got a comment here from Albus dot band. Oh, Albus. He says, "Why are you so handsome? And does it help that your slide tone to best Josh Scott's question mark? All my love." Even though that's a super chat, I'm not going to answer that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know what the question is there, Albus. But uh, well, it had a question mark on it, so it, it's obviously hold a question. On, let me see. Why? Are, uh, and oh, and does it help your slide tone to best? Oh, does it help your does slide your tone? Help? Yeah, um, no, it doesn't. I, I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe my height does, but then t Josh is taller than me, so. Oh. So like the shorter you are, the more concentrated your slide tone is. Yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe his slide tone is spread out over his. God, what is he? Six foot seven, something like that. Six foot eight. Yeah, that's it. Just but like that doesn't not, check out because saturated enough. Because Greg Cock is taller than both Josh and I, and he's mm. one of the most slamming. Well, slide there's an exception to every rule. It's true. I mean, that makes the rule true. You know. Gregory Cockery is the exception to the rule. Always. Okay, anything you miss about doing random bar cover gigs? Yes. Yes. Um, I, I wish I could just once a month go and play some shitty bar in Buckhead again. I used to do that all the time. And at the time, it was kind of tough because that's how I was trying to make money. And I would be on these three four hour long bar gigs and would make like 70 bucks the end of the night or something like that. So it really was hard. Um, mm -hmm. But now that that's no longer my primary like breadwinner breadwinning type of gig, I think I would love to go back and do it just for fun. Just go up there, no pressure, no rehearsal with a, a band and go just play cover songs for three or four hours to a bunch of drunk people in Atlanta. Like, it's, it's fun, man. It's fun. You just get up there and mess around and play guitar with your friends for a few hours. Like, come on. What's not to love about that? So I would love to get back into it, but it's tough right now. You know, with the pandemic and, and everything, it's uh, it's just... I think I think live music will be back fully, hopefully, by this time next year, but we'll see. Well, yeah, there's just less gigs in general, you yeah. know? Less bar gigs. Yep. 
So uh, RC Santiago says, what does it look like for a guitarist to play in the pocket? It's kind of an open question. Um, listen to the rhythm section and understand that you're part of the rhythm section and listen to what the drummer and bass player are doing instead of listening to just yourself. I think that's mm. pretty much it. And that's that's much easier said than done. Um, I don't want I don't want people to think that it's so easy to just like not pay attention to what you're playing. Um, it helps when you're playing with a consistent group of people. When you're playing with the same drummer and the same bass player on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, because what happens is you start to learn their idiosyncrasies and you start to learn where they're going to go and how they're going to play off of each other. And then if you're listening. Um, and playing with them instead of on top of them, then you start to find where you fit in that mix, in that rhythm mm -hmm. section. So, uh, for example, like Ian Guthrie and Philip Conrad, the uh, drummer and bass player from Noah Guthrie and Good Trouble. I've played with those dudes for almost 10 years. I know that rhythm section like the back of my hand. I know what Ian's going to do. I know the type of fills he's going to do. I know where he's going to leave space. I know where he's going to dig in. Same thing with Phil. I know where Phil is going to try and fill up the sound a little bit. And I know where I can fit in there and where I need to step out and where I need to lay back. Uh, and same thing with Noah, like listening to Noah and listening to the vocalist and knowing where you need to lay back and let the vocal step forward and knowing when you need to step out and embellish. It's all listening, really. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that takes years to develop because as guitar players, when we learn, what well, any instrument is this way, but like I think specifically as guitar players, we're obsessed with learning lead guitar. Everyone wants to play lead guitar. Everyone wants to solo. Everyone wants to be the front man, front guitar player. But you soon realize whenever you do start playing with other people and playing in gigs that you are actually part of the rhythm section and most of the gig you're playing rhythm guitar and a lot of us don't necessarily practice rhythm guitar which is a shame because it's actually really fun mm. and by rhythm guitar i don't i don't just mean like you know uh like uh like the rhythm guitar is much wider than just you know funk rhythms or rhythm sort of cliches that we all we all play. Um, it's it's a lot of chord harmony, chord structure, knowing what voicings to play, knowing you know when to play diamonds or when to arpeggiate chords or you know when to double bass lines and all this kind of stuff. It's a it's a deep deep realm that I love. Actually, I I I much prefer playing rhythm guitar most times than taking a solo or something more fun for me yeah i'd say it's kind of like that big picture playing rather than like very focused playing which is really hard like what you're talking about you know ch making all these choices are not it's not really like what do i play it's when do i play these like certain set of things that i have that i know you know yeah. and like deciding to do that is something that's extremely difficult to figure out and it helps if you like I started, like you were talking about having like people that you've played together with 10 for 10 years. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, and then you can start to pick it up. I mean, so like if you're if you're in a, a church gig, right? This was the thing for me for a long time when I was doing those mega church gigs here in Atlanta. You'd be on a rotation from like different churches from week to week and then every single time you'd be playing with a different band and you would have a lot of the same players would rotate in and out. So you'd have your friends and stuff, but the combinations of bands would be different every time. And I actually think that that was huge for me in teaching me how to listen because every single week I was playing with a different drummer, different bass player combination. Mm. And then in the worship world, it's a little more convoluted because a lot of times you have like eight singers on the front of the stage and like all of them are playing an acoustic guitar or something. So it's like you and then you've got like two or three keyboard players. So as a guitar player, you really have to pick your battles and like where you're you're fitting in. That's a that's a whole other discussion. Um, but yeah, like that time spent playing with all those different people and listening to their idiosyncrasies and trying to find what worked or what, you know, where they were going to go and where you were trying to fit in. Um, it's really important. And it just comes from experience, man. There's no like, 
no YouTube video that you're going to watch that's going to teach you that and walk. You're, you're not going to walk away with that information. It literally just comes from doing it over and over and over again, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm dealing with that right now, trying to figure out how to do that. I told you a couple weeks ago, I just got a gospel gig, yep. like a gospel church gig. And it's kind of that thing what you're talking about, like a rotating cast of people. And I'm having a hard time, like trying to fit in, man. I'm having yeah. a hard time. Yeah, those gospel gigs will stretch you. I, I had a gospel, I played at a gospel style church for a long time, and that was the most musically intense and demanding gig I've ever had. Uh, to yeah. the point where that particular church was not a great place to play because it was incredibly stressful, um, and, mm. and the leadership was was pretty terrible, actually. Um, but musically, it was huge <laughs> it really really stretched me i was uh, i was punching way above my weight class in that gig uh but i was there for like a year and dude just barely holding on i got to play with israel houghton a few times on that Oof. gig and yeah i mean when you talk about like i felt like i was just white knuckling holding on during the whole service like trying to keep track of all the runs and the substitutions and where we're going while that's, watching him and seeing where he's going to go. And uh, that's exactly what it feels like. It's I, that you're just barely holding on. Like you have no idea what hits are next. This guy's going to say seven numbers to you in the mic. Like, and then you're just expected <laughs> to just do all of that, like all at once, or he's just not going to say numbers and start doing hits and you just got to catch it. Dude. I had on it's, more than one occasion at this one church, um, this church shall remain nameless, but this was like a mega, mega, mega huge place. And we would have rehearsals on Thursday nights, which were like three or four hour rehearsals where we, we would, sh I mean, I had to like shed during the week on these tunes mm -hmm. and, um, we'd show up to rehearsal, we'd rehearse everything. And then we'd get there. Like, I think call time was like 6am. And so it was a 45 minute drive for me. So I was up at like four thirty or five on the Sunday morning. Wow. And we do two or three run throughs of the entire set on Sunday morning. And on more than one occasion, we're like walking, literally walking out on stage. And the MD would come in and say, uh, pastor doesn't like the set. We're changing it. We're doing these four songs and these keys. Mm -hmm. And three of the four songs I've never heard before. Like they don't even know, have no idea where, how they go or how they sound. And I'm playing lead guitar. Like I'm supposed to be uh, like stepping out and playing these lines and, uh, so there were some Sunday mornings where I just rolled my volume pedal off and like just sat there and, you know, looked like I was comping chords because I had no idea what I was doing. But yeah, that dude, that happened to me this Sunday. That happened to me, or well, Saturday. And it, honestly, it's fun. It's really fun. It's like scary, but it's fun. Like he sent me the songs. I show up. They're like, yeah, we had to change MDs and like there's a guest singer or whatever. And uh, yeah, we're not doing any of those songs. Can you just play it by ear? Yeah. And I was just like, you know. I just kind of did it and did my best. Yeah. And I kind of probably looked a little bit like a fool, but I also, you know, hey, had fun. I had fun. It's It can be a fun situation. Super Sam in the chat says, punching above your weight class is how you get better. And you're right. The problem with this particular organization was that the those in leadership made it a very toxic environment in that they made you feel like your gig was always on the line, depending on oh. how well you played that Sunday. And yeah. when you're thrown into situations like that where you don't know the music and then you're made to feel like your your future of income and work is on the line based off of your performance, it, it was just a terrible. I, that's the church I ended up getting fired from because they found out that I drink bourbon. Um, <laughs> what? That's, yeah. Yeah, that's a oh, whole. That's a story right That's there. a story. Yeah. Okay, I've so told it before, but it's a story. Uh, Sugar Tooth says he uh, he donated five dollars. Thank you. He says I enjoy Phil's new YouTube content. Do you guys ever talk shop about YouTube stuff, or is he mostly doing things on his own? Do you ever advise newer YouTube creators? I talk about YouTube all the time with people. Um, I am I am advising Phil. I'm helping him out. Um, we we talk YouTube quite a bit. So for those of you that don't know, Philip Conrad, Philip Conrad Bass on YouTube. Phil's one of my best friends. He's one of my most trusted musical allies. <laughs> uh, he's the bass player from Deacon Knight, if you don't know, and the bass player from Noah Guthrie and Good Trouble. And um, he has been talking about starting a YouTube channel for a long time, a bass channel, and he's finally doing it. And when I tell you that his videos are super well done, 
They are so good, and he's filming everything on his iPhone. He's doing everything with a cell phone right now. Dude doesn't even have a camera. But his videos are incredibly creative. They're beautifully shot and edited. Phil is... um. Phil and his, his wife, Shay, are two of the most creative people that I know. Um, and, and he's incredibly well thought and, uh, and, and just very deliberate in his actions. And it, it's just, it really comes through. So, yeah, everyone go check him out. Philip Conrad. Um, somebody post him up in the chat here. Um, and go show him some support because, yeah, who knows? He keeps posting videos. He may end up doing this, doing this full time. So. Yeah, Mike Buchanan with a $5 donation. He says, thanks for the entertainment and the information provided on your channel. Glad to have caught the live stream. Looking forward to more Backstage Chronicles. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Appreciate that, man. Um, Luke in the chat's asking, do you think a hobbyist can, pro can become an exceptional guitar player uh, with 30 minutes per day of practice, or is there an upper limit? Well, I mean, we all start off as hobbyists at some point. Like, even the best players out there, your favorite players out there, at some point they weren't doing this professionally, right? Like they weren't doing this for a living. So I guess you would call that a hobby hobbyist. So yes, you absolutely can go from hobbyist to professional. Professional just means that you're you're getting money and making a portion or all of your living from doing that thing. Um, so you know, keep that in mind. In terms of the daily practice regimen and time spent, I think it's less rigid than that. I think as long as you're playing your guitar every day and you're listening to music and you're working on it every day, you can see positive results with 10 minutes a day, two hours a day. Um, you know, I think it is, it goes without saying that the more time you spend in it, the faster that you're going to progress. But as long as you're doing it every day and you're being productive in your time spent with the guitar, then yeah, you're, you're, you're going to be fine. And it depends on what you want to do. Like there are some people out there that have no desire to make a living with a guitar in their hand, but they spend more time playing and practicing guitar than I do, you know, and they're better players than me probably. Like that's, there's no correlation necessarily between skill and ability um, or talent even, and whether or not you can make a professional living with it. There's way more that goes into it than just, you know, how good you are at your instrument. Um, yeah. This, this next question kind of ties into that. How does one go about getting church gigs or any sort of consistent gigs in general? Yeah. So, um, it kind of goes back to that saying, it's all who, you know, like that is, that is a hundred percent true in this industry. Um, Every gig I've ever gotten, every opportunity I've ever had has come from, with the exception of YouTube, really. I mean, YouTube is the thing that you just start doing, you start making it, and it kind of sort of grows on its own. But like, in terms of gigs and opportunities as a guitar player, it's always come from a relationship with somebody. Um, and you have to be careful when you talk about this, because I think some people get the idea that it's about networking and like building relationships with people so that you can get gigs and that's really not how it works it it really comes from at least in my experience it's come from good friendships with people like actual relationships where you're not just in it to try and land a gig with somebody um i have done that before i have tried to do the networking thing and it's never worked um, I've tried to position myself in relationships with people thinking that it would like s take a step forward in my career and it's never worked. The only thing that has helped has been like having a good relationship, being reliable, being a good hang and knowing your stuff. Now, in terms of like more practical advice, if you want to land a church gig or a more or a more um, consistent gig, whether it's a wedding band or a bar band or a touring band, an original artist, whatever, I think... Um, a, you need to put yourself in a position where those opportunities are available. So if that's a church, then you maybe start attending that church and making it known to the people like, hey, I'm a guitar player. Hey, I would love to play. Hey, how, how does this work? How do I get involved? Like, just ask a few questions. Um, if it's an artist that you want to play for, start going to their shows. If there's open jams or open mic nights happening in your city, 
those are full of musicians that are playing and looking for gigs and, and trying to get out and work, especially now that people are coming out of the pandemic a little bit and starting to play music again. If there's an open mic or an open jam, start going. Make some friends. Go consistently. Get up and play. Like, hang out. Just be be in the scene. Make the hang with people. And eventually opportunities will start coming. And when those opportunities do come, that's when it's up to you to show up on time, mm-hmm. be prepared, know your stuff, sound good, know your tone, have a reliable rig. Um, that's when all of that those like practical skills come into play. But um, you know, yeah. your, the quality of your guitar tone is not going to like make someone come out of the woodwork and like offer you a gig. Well, there are always exceptions to the rule. I mean, unless you're playing like a genuine like germanium fuzz, but yeah, you know, those are getting more hard to come by. So. Yeah, I mean, really, I I agree. Like, just show up. Just show up places and, and be there consistently and just show your face and be nice to people and the gigs will come. You have to be present to win. Yeah. That's, that's really it. Well, I mean, I did win. get that. I did get the aforementioned gospel gig from a uh, Uber ride. So just ride in as many Ubers as you can. <laughs> yeah. It's not a joke. I got that from an Uber ride. Yeah. So. Yeah, just in every opportunity. You at the airport, just walk around and be like, hey, you guys play music? Need a guitar player? Hey. Well, I mean, just Uber Uber everywhere you have to go. Just stop driving. Just Uber. It's Uber. a pretty cost-effective way to, to th- you know, to do it, if you think about it, because eventually you'll land a gig, and you'll you'll make some of that money back, I'm sure. So, uh, yeah. Great or, career I mean, or, or Lyft, maybe. Lyft yeah, Lyft. Work. Yeah, sure. Either one, really. Take the bus. <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, uh, what's the deal with ohms? How do I make my head blow up my cab or not blow up my cab? They make your head so I'm assuming you don't want to blow up your cab. You're, you're, so it's the other way around. You don't want to blow up your head. Wrong cab. So I say this uh, with the caveat of being a guitar player and not a amp technician or builder. Um, generally, your best bet is to match the ohm rating or resistance of the amp to the load or the cabinet or the speaker. For instance, if I'm using a a 16 ohm cab, like I am over here with my um, Wonderland Overdrive, that's a 112 with a 16 ohm speaker in it. I'm gonna use the 16 ohm output from the amp to do so. That's gonna give you the best performance from the amp. It's gonna give you the best sound, in my opinion. Uh, and it's not going to blow up your amp. The reality is if you miss, as I understand it, if you mismatch ohms, more than likely you're not going to blow up your amp. I say that with a grain of salt. Take that with a grain of salt. Um, You can go from, like, for instance, if that's a 16-ohm cab, I could run 8 ohms out of the amp into that 16-ohm cab, and it would be okay. Uh, but you don't want to go the other way. I wouldn't want to run 16 ohms out of the amp into a 4 ohm cab or an 8 ohm cab because the load is mis- mismatched. What's more important than that, though, with tube amps, is they always need to see a load. So that means if you have a head, you should always have it plugged into a cab or a reactive load or a load box, something that's going to give the output transformer somewhere to send the current. Otherwise, you run the risk of blowing up your amp. Um, so there you go. Yeah. Matthew Kohler says long time listener, first time super chatter. <laughs> long time. First time. <laughs> I saw you comment on the John Mayer episode of talking watches. Are you a watch guy? Any favorite watches? Uh, I'm a watch guy that can't afford to be a watch guy. So, mm. um, yeah, the, the watch world is <laughs> watch out. <laughs> yeah. oh, wow. <laughs> I'm just going to mute you. for a minute. That's cool. Um, yeah, I like watches. I like mechanical things. I'm, I've always been a huge car guy. I've always went, ever since I was a kid. I've been obsessed with like airplanes and like a lot of people. Um, I have that mechanical gene, and so for me, like being able to wear this like mechanism on my wrist that looks cool and provides a function is is really cool. Uh, if I could have any watch, I think I'd want a just a Rolex Submariner, just a straight ahead Rolex. That would be my thing. People always ask about this watch. This is not a Rolex. This is a. This is my wife's thirtieth birthday gift to me last year. Um, this is a Shinola Monster. Um, so it's it's my first like automatic watch, 
Looks like a Rolex. It's not a Rolex. I love it. Really, really love it. Wear it every day. So. Uh, this one I've seen I've seen a couple times so far. Hey, Rhett, what's the best song from James Taylor to better your acoustic playing? Um, kind of a specific question. I, I think Sweet Baby James is a really great one. Mm. Um, there is a young cowboy who's on the range who said his head on his only companion. Um, Fire and Rain is cool. Um, any any of James's like kind of straight ahead acoustic songs are really going to get you in shape. Also, he did a version. He did a Christmas song that he posted on YouTube years and years ago. That's on his YouTube channel. I'm trying to remember which one it is, but there's like an instructional video that he did with it that you should um you should check out. It's uh it's one of the cr- old Christmas standards that he does a solo acoustic rendition of Jingle Bell Rock. Yeah, um, Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. It's it's pretty great when James plays it. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Ed Zed says, can you, stel- can you tell the story of how you found Chris? Yes. That's a long, long Well, actually, journey. this ties into what we were talking about earlier, about, like, it's all who you know. So He found me. Yeah, in a wicker basket in the river. <laughs> I was sent from jazz school down the river. Yeah, that's how that's what they do. And here, he here. rescued me and he took me in. At K- Kennesaw Jazz School, they they send you off down the Chattahoochee River to be found by a, a trio or quartet or jazz singer. <laughs> um, no, okay, so this goes back to it's all who you know. So I was in desperate need of um, a skilled uh, creative assistant for a really long time. And just kind of put it off and put it off. So at the beginning of this year, um, I reached out to one of my former teachers from AIM, a guy named Trey Wright, who had since gone on to teach jazz guitar. Is he head of the guitar department at Kennesaw? Uh, I mean, he's the only guitar teacher at Kennesaw. So he's, he's yes. not. He, so, yes, he is the head of the guitar department. Um, he's a great guy. Yeah. Trey Wright is amazing. Yeah, Trey. Um, Trey's the guy that like opened me up to listening to jazz and stuff for the first time. He's the one that showed me "Kind of Blue" by Miles Davis when I was mm-hmm. in school. Um, so I reached out to Trey and I said, "Hey, man, I need someone who is a great player, um, who can understand, you know, video video editing, has an eye for videography, who understands like what I'm trying to do in this YouTube thing. Do you have anyone?" He was like, "Yes, I have the perfect guy. He's about to graduate." You know, he's really great at, at you know, he, he really spoke highly of you. Oh. And so then we set up a Zoom call and that was it. Like we didn't have to, I didn't have, I thought I was going to have to like interview a bunch of people and try and find someone. And it was going to be this whole thing. And literally the first person I asked got me hooked up with Chris. Uh, and Chris has been great. You know? Well, well, thank you. Yeah. Like he, um, it, it's, he's a great player. Uh, and and great with ideas and and you didn't know much about the YouTube thing when we first started, but no, it seemed to be picking things up pretty quick. Well, I cool. I wasn't like a huge watcher of the YouTube like music scene really. Uh, I am more so now, but before that, I was mostly watching like educational like science videos on YouTube, like you know things like Veritasium, like yeah, stuff we stuff smarter we watch, every day. yeah, smarter every yeah, day, all that type all of that stuff. stuff. Yeah, so, but this goes back to the thing we were talking about earlier, which is to say, like, I asked Trey for a recommendation. And because of Chris's relationship with Trey and his ability and the fact that he was a diligent worker and, like, showed up on time and always did well in school and everything, when the opportunity was presented to Trey, Trey said, yes, I've got the perfect guy. So that's really what it comes down to with this kind of stuff. It's like... A gig is going to come your way because a friend of a friend or somebody asks somebody that you know, hey, I need somebody for this. And then they're going to think of you. And so that's that's how everything works in this industry. It's all who you know and it's, you know, who your friends are and your relationships. And so that's why it's important, I think, to always be a good hang, be reliable, be a good friend, um, and your career will... uh, should unfold. Yeah. Also, I have to plug. I have to plug Trey Wright. You got to go check out his music. It's amazing. He's also uh, 
the only person that I know that has music on Delta in-flight entertainment. What? If you fly on Delta Airlines, you can find Trey Wright's music like on the little screen. My yeah. God. Yeah. His music is great. It's Dude, awesome. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Shout out to Trey Wright. What a guy. You know. Yeah. Okay. What do we got next? Uh, well, Matt Welsh says, yeah, but what sucks about Chris? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, his car breaks down all the time. That's true. It does. It broke down today. Yeah. For what, the fourth time? I think so. Yeah. And it's totally dead this time. <laughs> it's completely gone. You finally killed it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Look, no, honestly, nothing. If, if anyone in the chat would like to donate a car to me. <laughs> yeah, literally right before we went on, we were uh, we were looking at new cars for Chris. What is it? The engine block is broke? It has a crack or something? <sighs> something like that. Either, either a head gasket is totally been replaced wrong because i got those replaced or the block is cracked so it's either way not great either way not great not great and it's an old minivan so you know i'm not too broken up about it yeah dodge minivan so yeah there you go uh oh i see a top chat here super chat uh the depth and whisper thanks for everything appreciate that man really appreciate the support um oh here's a good one patrick says greetings from the netherlands what were you smoking in your last vid? There was smoke. <laughs> there was smoke behind you at some point. <laughs> Do you smoke cigarettes or something else? Uh, no, I don't smoke cigarettes. Um, and also, let me know what part of the Netherlands are you in. But uh, no, that wasn't weed. I know that's what everybody was thinking that we're smoking joints in here. Um, I burn incense sometimes. It's right, right there on my amp rack. There's a little incense burner, and so I had just lit up a stick of incense, and so it was drifting across with this light behind me right here. And it looked like, it did look like I just, you know, ripped a bong or something, but. Hot box in the studio? Yeah, yeah. Nothing against it, but uh, yeah. I, it just, it makes me paranoid. Um, I have like really bad ADHD and I, I've seen some places, it's very anecdotal, but I've seen some places that suggest that uh, THC can cause like really negative psychological effects in people uh, in people with ADHD like me. And that has been my experience with cannabis. Um, it's, I've had a few good experiences with it, but most of my experiences with it have been really bad, paranoid, like anxiety attacks, panic attacks. So yeah, no fun, no fun, but uh, bourbon, that's a different story. Hey, <laughs> do you always use new strings? Like every, every time you make a video or do gigs, if not, then how often do you change them? No, <laughs> I change them when they're so gross and rusty that it literally, like, you can hear your fingers running down the unwound strings. Because like you're playing barbed wire? Yeah, that's when I change them. Um, I should change them more often, but I hate changing strings. It's not fun. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I just, I play them until they're dead, dead. But that doesn't take very long for you, does it? No, but still, it's just, it's still a pain in the ass. I don't like doing it. Do you have any? Do you have any thoughts on the Harmony Six Series Two amps? I'd like to try one out. Actually, um, I thought I thought about reaching out to Harmony and see if they would send me one to to, uh, to test out and use. But um, from the stuff I've seen online so far, they look pretty good. I'm excited about that Harmony brand. Um, it seems to be they're they're gonna make some waves in the guitar world over the next few years. They're owned by um, Band Lab, which is a company out of Singapore and Band Lab now owns Monocase, they own Guitar Magazine, they own Harmony, they own Tysco. Um and I know those Harmony guitars are built oh and they also own Heritage because those Harmony guitars are built in the same factory as Heritage guitars. And I've played a few of the Harmony guitars and they they are really good, man. Like they really punch above their weight class. Um for what they are priced at, you know, if the shapes mm -hmm. are something that you dig, you're kind of looking for that funky vintage guitar thing. I think they're really good. So yeah, Super Sam Ten, thanks for the donation. He says, "Bro, you're an inspiration. Your fretboard fundamentals course is great. Keep up the great work, man. Got to get truck and have a great day." Oh, I appreciate that, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, thank you. We worked really hard on that course, on the fretboard course. So it's um, it's really cool to hear positive feedback from it. Um, from what I've seen, most people that've taken it have liked it. So. Yeah. Oh, by the way, that opportunity to plug, 40% off the Nashville number system course uh, through the rest of the week if you use the code NNS40 at checkout. So if you're uh, watching this later, get your hands on that course, 40% off. 
R Ram says, what's your favorite piece of cheap gear? Sure, SM57. They are... I really think that that particular microphone might take the cake for best all-around budget piece of gear because they're 100 bucks brand new and it's the one piece of gear that you see in every single recording studio it's on almost every single stage everywhere they sound great they're incredibly useful if you're looking or thinking about getting into a basic recording setup for your guitar rig at home or you want to start traveling with your own mics when you're gigging and stuff get one get an sm57 Buy a brand new from Sweetwater or wherever for 100 bucks. You'll have it for the rest of your life. That mic will outlive you, more than likely. Um, and, yeah, you can use it on vocals. You can use it on acoustic instruments. You can use it on, I mean, guitar cabs, drums, everything. Um, they do a thing. They're not super transparent. I mean, a 57 sounds like a 57, mm-hmm. but it's a it's a good thing. So that's what I would say. Yeah. Um. So the uh, Patrick who commented earlier, he said he's he lives in Rotterdam, Rotterdam, Netherlands, and he wants to do a gig in his neighborhood soon. Man, I played I played uh, well near Rotterdam in um, December 2019. We played I forget the name of the venue. Paul Davids came out to that show because he lives near there. Um, uh, God, what was the name of that venue we played? Let me tell you something. The Netherlands does live music right. I. I've had the best experience playing live and touring in Holland. Um, All of the venues there are incredibly nice. The engineers and people that run the venues are so well qualified, incredibly nice. They're so good at their jobs. Uh, Like you'd show up at the venue every night and there would be like the general manager, the front of house engineer, the monitor engineer and the stage hands waiting on you to get out of your van with like a tray of coffee. (laughs) You'd get out of the van and we're not playing big rooms. We're playing like 150 cap to 200 cap rooms, you know? And uh, still, they treated you well. The venues were so nice. Uh, I can't wait to go to over there again. That was, that was awesome. The Netherlands makes American rock clubs look like just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, also, yeah. uh, Craig William, thank you for the donation. I, thank oh, you. yeah. Thanks, yeah. Craig. Uh, see, he, he has to... He has to um, I don't see a question. A question. No, he's got one down here. Let me see. Oh, here. he does. Uh, do you wrap over or under the stop tail with a TAM bridge? I recently started wrapping over the top, and it's making 11s feel like 9s in your Les Paul. Also, are you still featuring music at the end of your pod? Um, so I recently tried wrapping um, the strings on my Les Paul, and I didn't really dig it. But maybe that's because I have nines on there, and it, it, it did make them feel really, really slinky. So, yeah, if you're running a heavier set of strings, I could see wanting to do that. Um, but for me, running nines, I just I leave it where it is. Uh, and am I still featuring music at the end of the pod? The podcast is on hiatus for the time being. Uh, with the studio build, and with Dipped in Tone, and with the YouTube channel, um, I've, I've got so much going on that I had to let something go. So I let the podcast go for the time being. Hmm. Pete Breen, thanks for the donation. Appreciate it, Pete. Thank you. Thanks for the stellar content, Rhett. Um, Let's see here. Any tips? Wilson L in the chat says, any tips on learning guitar for bass? That's interesting. So learning guitar for a bass player, usually the question goes the other way, learning bass for a guitar player. But Mm -hmm. um, yes, really learn your chords and learn how to play with a pick. That's something that a lot of my bass flare <laughs> bass flare friends. <laughs> bass Jesus Christ. Bass player friends. Uh that's something I've seen some of them have trouble with is like being able to use a pick well. Which makes sense because if you spend all your time playing, you know, finger style then oh, well, and it's know. it's totally vice versa, you know. Yeah. Like I I can't play bass because of the my fingers just don't want to do the thing. You yeah, know? it's it's tough. It can be tough to learn. So I would say, yeah, work on your pick technique. Learn how to alternate pick. Work, work, learn your chord theory up and down the neck. Um, starting with your triads. Really get comfortable with triad shapes. Uh, and then go from there. What's up, Robert? Robert Baker in the chat, everybody. So, uh, 
thoughts on thoughts on Floyd Rose guitars? Not my thing. Uh, yeah, it's too too complicated. Too many moving parts. I don't like that you lock the strings down. Yeah, Floyd's Floyd's aren't my thing. But so. you can dive bomb. Yeah, you can dive bomb. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thoughts on uh, Sir guitars? I like Sirs. Um, I played a handful of them, and I have some friends that have them. I think they're incredibly well made. My experience with them, though, has been that they tend to lack a little vibe, a little personality. The the Sirs that I've played have felt very sterile, um, which has been my similar experience with a lot of PRS guitars. Like PRSs are incredibly well made, beautiful guitars that, in my opinion, feel just sort of sterile. Um, that's just my opinion. So, Sirs, I've never played an actual John Sir made Sir, though. That's the thing. Um, and, and from what I understand, my friend Ben Forehand, uh, used to sell them here in Atlanta back when I think, uh, John was making them. And he was telling me that they, those guitars are incredible, but I've never played an actual, like, Sir, Sir. So, um, yeah. There yeah. you go. Robert Baker. He says, what guitar you thought you would like, but you didn't? Um, What's a guitar? <laughs> what's a guitar I thought I would like, but didn't? That's a good question. You know, the... Uh, there's that Jazz Master that Fender sent over. Uh, the, three humbu- uh, the three P90 Jazz Master. Um... That it's just not it for whatever reason that guitar is not resonating with me. It's a great guitar, um, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's because I have I've been spoiled with the Novo, which is like the best jazz master guitar style guitar that I would ever have. So it, it's kind of hard to beat. But it's like, hey man, I just got really good taste. I don't pick bad guitars. <laughs> it's not a bad <laughs> guitar, is the thing. It's like, um, and that's the thing to think to to keep in mind when you're talking about gear and stuff online. A lot of this stuff is so subjective. So what I like or what I don't like doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad or good piece of gear. It may be perfect for somebody else, but it's just not for me. Um, And so that's something to keep in mind when you're on forums or you're watching my videos or anybody else's videos here on YouTube. Like It it comes down to you and what you like and what you want to play and what you want to hear, not what I think is is best or what you know somebody on the gear page thinks is best Mm. i think this is a great question jesse hopkins he says who do you think you are (laughs) fantastic question i i don't know (laughs) i don't know i don't don't know why anybody watches me or pays attention but uh here we are (laughs) here i am hey Rhett, love what you do any tips on guitar maintenance and is it worth it to learn how to fix your own guitars? I think so. I think if you're interested in it, um, it can be a really, really useful skill set to have. A, you can save money on you know setups and basic maintenance and stuff. Um, so I would say definitely worth 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 learning. In terms of guitar maintenance tips, have a basic tool set around that's guitar specific. Um, nowadays, it's easy to get. Ones like D'Addario makes some really cool guitar maintenance kits that you can get that are really cool. Um, you know, the, the proper screwdrivers and Allen keys and and you know something to hold the neck on and, and everything. Um, and just learn the basics. Learn how to set your intonation. Learn how to set the neck, the truss rod properly. Learn about pickup height adjustment. Those are the things you're going to be doing the most often. As the guitar, as the seasons change and the guitar setup kind of drifts in and out, you want to be competent with adjusting your truss rod properly, sighting down the neck, um, you know, getting your pickups aligned, getting your intonation set. From there, I think the next step would be like some basic fret work, like being able to level and crown your frets yourself if you're interested in that. Um, and then if you really want to take it that much further, you could get into doing your own refrets, uh, finishing, refinishing guitars, building guitars from scratch. Like it's really as far as you want to take it. For me, I'm not super handy, and I don't have a ton of patience for stuff like that, so I've learned the hard way several times that it's better for me to take my guitars, 
to someone who's good at that stuff mm -hmm. um, and just pay them to do it. So that's the trade-off for me. Yeah, as someone who's not very mechanically minded, I always have trouble, like, I'm like, which way do I turn the thing to make the neck do the thing? <laughs> I, I, it's, it's hard for me to grasp. I'd have no idea why, but I, every time I have to do it, I go back and watch another YouTube video every single yeah. time. Every time I have to try and intonate a guitar, I still have to watch a video to remember which way it goes. Like, oh, if it's flat, it needs you need to move the saddle forward. Like, I... I can never remember how to do that. It, it seems like some people just have like an intuition where they just know, or once you tell it to them once, they're just like, oh, that, it makes sense to me. And yeah, some people are just really hand, handily minded like that. And I'm just not, I'm not that way. Yeah. Scott Baines, thanks for the donation. He says, YouTube Supergroup, you, Rick Beato, Dave Honorato, Jason Tillery, and Jack Jones. Let me know when I can pre-order the record. Jack Jones, my God. Uh, my friend Kelly just played bass on Jack Jones's record a few weeks ago. They just were in the studio recording for Jack's album. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that or not, actually. Uh, you didn't hear that from me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jack Jones is a monster drummer. I've gotten to work with him over at Rick's studio several times for videos, and my God, can that guy play the drums? Um, yeah, I don't know. I... I don't know what being in a band with Rick Beato would be like. If it's anything like doing session work for him, it would be pretty interesting. Um, playing with Dave would be fun. I would just like to play rhythm guitar for Dave. Here's how it would how it would go. I would play rhythm guitar. Dave would play lead. Rick would play bass because Rick's actually a monster bass player. Uh, and Jack Jones on drums. That would be that would be a fun setup. And then we could just do grunge covers. That's what I'd want to do. <laughs> just just cover uh, yeah. Soundgarden. And Pearl Jam songs. That'd be cool. That'd be fun. Robert Baker, he says, please make a shirt that says, who do you think you are? <laughs> and a follow-up question from uh, Evan Ogden. How dare you? How, how, how dare, you? dare you? Sit here on the internet and talk to people with your guitar. How could you? Unthinkable. Unthink I'm unsubscribing right now. <laughs> and Go I'm ahead. unclicking the bell. I'm un I'm, you know what? I'm going to unclick the bell. I'm going to unsub... And I'm gonna thumbs down this video. That hurts. It hurts so bad. You could um, be, you could become one of those vi uh, people that thumbs down the video as soon as it goes live. I think there's like ten or eleven people now. That's just there. me. Oh, I have it's just 10, you. Ten or eleven alternate accounts oh, that nice. I do that. Got to keep 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 people humble, you know. Well, it's interaction. You know, it's it, it's engagement. <laughs> Great. Uh, uh, Randy Crooks in the chat. Do you have any experience with Schecter PT specials? I don't actually. Um, I have almost no experience with Schecter guitars. Um, thank you for the for the donation. I, I know there's a lot of people that do dig the Schecters. Have you ever played one? No, no. Oh, there you go. No experience here. <laughs> Thanks, Matthew. Just thumbs down. Appreciate it. <laughs> uh, nice. Oh, Rolling House is back. Look to or looking to order a Novo. You're a Tele guy, but damn, the Saris J is calling your name. Go J or T. Maybe Solus F1. Well, if you're between a J and a T, I would probably steer you clear of the Solus. It sounds like you you know what you want. Um, my Saris J is my pride and joy. But I will tell you, and Chris will tell you, the best playing guitar... Um, just in terms of like playability and setup, the best playing guitar in this studio is this right here, the Hands Saris down. T. This Hands guitar down. is a monster. Um, in fact, this is probably the guitar I play most often when when I'm just at home. Um, I don't play it live as much like with Noah specifically is because he's got a Saris T mm. and so when I'm playing with him I, I grab a different guitar but dude this this is a, a beast right here this I think guitar. you should embrace that you should both have the same guitar and you should be both wearing the same outfit <laughs> we both wear big hats on stage so that's you know well, I'm thinking more of like an all white vibe I think that would really go well that's a brave choice <laughs> that's a brave choice so to answer your question um if I had to have one, it would be the Saris J, without a doubt. But the T is 
a monster guitar. God, I love this guitar. This one's six pounds, three ounces. I mean, it's a featherweight. This will probably be the guitar I take to Germany for uh, the record in November. <laughs> This guitar slaps. Yeah. It's got that like perfect blend of like accuracy, but also has that character to it. Yeah. It's just oh. Chef's kiss. It's so good. <laughs> What's the plan for your studio, Rhett? Tom <sighs> Tom Keenan asks. Well, I'll show you guys. Um give you a quick update here. I showed the inner circle members this past weekend. Um they got a little uh, little early access to it, but give you a quick photo update here. We need a way I need a way that I can just get this on the stream quickly. And, and have it on a button here, you know, so like that or something, but it pops up a picture. So um, here is the studio slash basement in its current form. Uh, if you follow me on Instagram, you probably saw that as well, but uh, we have, it has been fully demoed downstairs. Everything has been gutted, taken down to the studs and we're ready to start framing it out. So the next step, uh, the studio designer slash builder, Jimmy Bird, is coming back out from LA the week of October 4th, and the plan is to spend two weeks uh, in October down there, swinging a hammer, framing some walls, um, getting everything routed. We have to redo the HVAC, we have to move the hot water heater, I have to redo all the electrical stuff down there. Um, it's it's a pretty big undertaking, but when it's done, we're gonna have one hell of a studio down there and uh, be able to do some really cool stuff. So, Joel yeah. Morris, thanks for the donation. He says thoughts on Chapman guitar and advice for playing twelve strings. Uh, man, I've n never played Chapman. I I don't know. Um, I mean, I think if you're into that type of guitar, they they look pretty cool. Um, but that is not necessarily my cup of tea. Now, as far as advice for playing 12 strings, 12 strings can be tricky. Um, I don't play them super often, but I have found the most success when using a lighter string gauge set on a 12 string and having it set up appropriately for the lighter gauge, um, both for acoustic and electric, but yeah, it's not something I do all that often. At least for the, the styles of stuff that I typically play, 12 string is not like a super common kind of sound. It sort of takes up a lot of space, which can be cool, but in most situations I find myself playing in, it's, I don't want that much mid-range being taken up by one guitar. Mm -hmm. You know? I feel, like, I feel like I don't hear it that often, to be honest. In yeah, general. not anymore. I mean, there definitely yeah. was a time when it was yeah. all over the place, but yeah, not anymore. So, Alonzo White, thanks for the donation. He says, love what you do, man. Keep up the great work. Thanks, Alonzo. Yeah. Appreciate that, man. Alexander Edwards, he says he's been learning message in a bottle after, his, after your video, and I'm struggling a little with the stretches. Any suggestions? Stretches are tough. Um, so for me, it's about thumb on the back of the neck, right? Right back here. And kind of getting under the fretboard like that. That usually helps me out. Um, an important thing to realize when you're practicing a technique, any technique, um, if, if it hurts, don't do it. So if your hand is like hurting or the stretching is, is causing you pain, just stop and, and try a different technique, give it some time, uh, and then come back to it later. But yeah, I, I like to do uh, thumb on the back of the neck, kind of in between my first finger and my third finger. And start with just that power chord, that root fifth there, right? That C sharp and G sharp. And then... The, the first time I saw you do that, I was kind of surprised. Because I feel like for most people, it's going to be easier to use their middle finger there instead of their ring finger. Really? Because like stretching between that pinky and the ring finger for me is really hard. Like if I were to play that, I would use my middle finger. See, for me, that doing the stretch here feels weird. I mean, it's, it's, 
not impossible, but it does. It feels a little strange. So uh, I'll, I go third finger, like just typical power chord with that ninth on there. A little gainy. And I actually think the proper way, or at least the way Andy Summers plays it, is he when he goes to the A, he doesn't um, play the open A string. From what I understand, he goes right there in the fifth position, sixth mm -hmm. string. So. But then that makes it weird to get to the B. So, or Either way, you're going to have a big jump somewhere. So I prefer to do it here. Yeah, and as long as you got the palm meeting thing going on, it really doesn't sound much different. Now there's your stretch. Yeah. The biggest stretch that I typically do is like a that that, A major six. I can, I can barely do that one. Like you gotta have big hands to do that. Like I'm kind of a I'm kind of a short guy. I'm like five eight, <laughs> and I can bear I can barely get that. It's like a tough. On a good that's day. a tough stretch, man. And, and it honestly depends on the day. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes your hands are a little bit so, more. So right, you know. exactly. Like so, right now I'm feeling that right here. Like that hurts. So I'm gonna stop. I'm not gonna continue to do that. Yeah. Uh, Boss Bach, he says, hey, Rhett, do you have any exercises or rituals to clear your mind before playing live? Or do you have just any, like, traditions playing live? Oh, that's a fun question. Yeah, um, yeah I, have some, I have some things that I like to do, like, um, on a gig, I, I will like to, if it's possible, I'll try and go and sit out in the venue at some point. So, before the show, um, what you have to understand is, like, you know, oftentimes if your gig is at, you know, nine o'clock or something, if you're on tour and you're playing at like eight o'clock, nine o'clock, it's when you're stepping on stage, you're rolling into the venue at like two or three in the afternoon and loading in at two or three. So after a sound check and or load in and sound check and everything, oftentimes you have like three or four hours of just nothing. Um, mm -hmm. And so during that time, I'll, I'll usually like sit in the venue and just kind of I guess you could call it meditating, but kind of just sit there and in silence and just kind of think. Um, physically, I like to do some warm ups. You know, I've talked about this kind of thing on the channel before, as well as this sort of finger confusion thing. I do that to warm up right before the show. Um, there's also this one my friend Ben Forehand taught me that I can never quite play properly, but the. Uh, for getting the hands woken up. That's a tongue twister. Yeah. My buddy Ben can play it like digga 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 Yeah, it's he's a monster. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um so it's just things like that. And then usually like if it's one of quote unquote my bands that I've been playing with forever. So if it's Noah, for example, we'll usually like get together as a group beforehand and like you know, hug it out and I, that is really important to me is like the sort of camaraderie of like being on the stage together and like with your friends and sharing that moment together is, is something that's important to me. So we, you know, we try and do that kind of stuff. So it's definitely got like a different vibe than like what we were talking about earlier, the bar gig yeah. type of thing. Like, especially when you have someone that is like the band leader and they have this creative vision that you're like contributing to and helping them realize and you're giving like this, this audience you know, who wants to see you this like cool experience. There's, there's some like weight to that, you know, there's some like reverence you have to have about that. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's, it's a, and you just play better. Like when, when you're having fun and you're on stage with your friends, you, you play better. It takes the pressure off. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're playing to each other and you're playing for each other a lot. It's, I love it. Yeah. Uh, Duffy, he uh, he donated. Thank you for the donation. He says, hey, Rhett, I'm a big fan. Just picked up the National Numbers course to teach slash convince the band to learn and use it. Oh, man. Thank you. Um, yeah, if, if you play in a group and you guys aren't using the number system, I, I genuinely think that you're missing out on a pretty key piece of communication. Um, a huge 
reason of why, at least the groups that I play with, we use the number system is because it's very clear and direct, right? When you're, when you're explaining a chord progression to somebody on the fly sometimes and you say six, four, one, five, as long as they know the key and they know the natural number system, then they're good. But if you're on stage and you're playing or you're in rehearsal or something, and MD yells at you from across the stage and says, it's a G minor. And you couldn't tell if he said G minor or B minor or D minor or C minor <laughs> or E minor. Like, you're screwed. You just don't know. So, yeah, it. I think if you're playing with people consistently, I, that's a pretty crucial skill set, I think. Is the is understanding the number system inside now, which is why I made a video course on it, which is currently forty percent off. Shameless plug. Um, code, code NNS forty. Yeah, code NNS, NNS forty at checkout for the next week. Get yourself the uh, national number system course. All right, we'll take a few more here. We got a donation from Working Man's Band. He says, "I played an outdoor gig recently, and the one one twelve wasn't cleaning up. What's your best amp you found for a loud, clean, punchy tone?" This one, right here. Uh, you want loud and clean and punchy. I like my FTR 37. That's a, a Fender style amp. So it's six V sixes in the power section. Um, I say Fender style because circuit wise, it's not based off of any particular like Fender amp. It's sort of just like sort of an American voiced amp, if you will. Um, I think if you're looking for a really clean pedal platform to build off of, I've had a lot of success over the years with my uh, Port City Pearl. That thing doesn't break up at all. It just gets louder. So um, if you want loud, clean headroom, that's a good example. There's a 100-watt version of that that amp and a 50-watt version of that amp. You can also get it in a combo. Um, Dr. Z, like a Maz 38 would be good. If you want, you're want, you wanting the higher headroom, cleaner, more power to move some air, Maz 38 is really great. Uh, an, a Vox, like an AC30, those will really move some air as well. Um, there's a lot of amps out there that'll cover that ground. It's really what what kind of flavor are you looking for and what mm-hmm. do you want to do with it? So I don't know. I like my uh, my Fender Vibrolux, like the reissue. It's super loud. It's two tens though, but right. it's super loud and super clean. It's it's extremely hard to get it to break up. It sounds good. Yeah, you'd yeah. be you'd be hard pressed to get it to break up. Yeah, and it's got that cool Tolex on it, which is which is dope. Mm-hmm. Um. Nice. Yeah, let's take uh, let's take one more here. Let's see, what's happening with Deacon Knight? I really like this band. Yes, uh, Deacon Knight. We're still a band. We didn't break up. What happened is everyone has gotten busy. So Jamie, the keys player and the singer, has been on the road with Thomas Rhett for the last year. So he's out playing. That's like a first class gig. He's on. I'm so jealous. <laughs> um, yes, he's been out with Thomas Rhett for a while. I believe he's coming off the road pretty soon, which is going to be cool. Um, Phil is working on film sets. He's working on big, big movies here in Atlanta. He's a boom op on film sets now. So he's doing that, and he's starting his own YouTube channel. Uh, Chadman, our drummer, is uh, gigging a lot, working a lot. He and I are actually working a lot together on some stuff coming up. And then I'm, you know, you guys know what I'm doing. So the plan is... Uh, once the studio is done, I would like to get the group back together to do either an EP or a full-length record and then bring back the full band live streams in some way, shape, or form. So bring back the backstage live show in some form or fashion, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's part of the reason for building the studio is to be able to have a space that we can do that kind of thing. So uh, Matt Newman in the, the Super Chat, can you talk about the gold top you were playing in Fretboard Fundamentals? Yes, I'll show you that this guitar actually was um, was given to me by a subscriber. It's so it's a heritage. This was given to me by Norm Mosley. Um, Norm is always like in the chat and in the comments. He's been a really great supporter of mine for a long time. Really, really nice guy. And um, yeah, he had this this gold top heritage and. Um, I mean, it's just, it's a ringer guitar. I really, really love this thing. I don't know what year it is. Um, he called it Bad Jack, which is why it's got that Bad Jack nameplate on the headstock. Um, let's see if it's in tune here.
Yeah, it, these mini humbuckers sound really, really great. <laughs> Stumbled through that riff, but uh, <laughs> yeah, this is a killer, killer guitar. So that's the story on it. All right, everyone. Well, that's going to do it for this week's uh, Tuesday Q&A. If you're watching this later, thanks for making it all the way to the end of the stream. We really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, who uh, donated and asked questions. I really appreciate the support. Uh, and let me know what you guys want to see on these uh, Tuesday lives here. Um, we're keeping them kind of low-key in, uh, in the chat. But we'd like to do some other things that are not just Q&As on YouTube. So let me know. Uh, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. Also, you can get 40% uh, off the Nashville Number System course with the code uh, NNS40 at checkout, retroguitarcourses.com. And uh, also check out the Inner Circle if you haven't done so already. You guys can get early access to the new video course while we're making it uh, for 10 bucks a month with the Inner Circle. So awesome, everyone. Thanks for hanging out, and I will see you all uh, next week. I think I have one more question. Oh. Who do you think you are? Oh my God. What gives you the right? Jesus Christ.